James chapter number 5. And uh, we're talking about patience here in this chapter. And um, patience is a subject that comes up in the first part of the, this particular letter. And again, James, uh, this book of the Bible, is an elongated conversation. And um, James is trying to encourage some Jewish believers. They were born in Jew. And uh, they were born again, and so maybe second or first and second generation uh, Jewish converts, and they have been scattered. And uh, James is trying to reach out to them and trying to encourage them, no doubt, with things in mind. And certainly the Holy Spirit of God, uh, you know, burdening him, encouraging him, speaking through him to these people. And so patience comes up again here at the end as well as prayer, which was also talked about in the beginning of this particular letter. And he kind of brings things full circle and talks about patience, prayer, about how we should conduct our, our life in view of needs and in view of trials. And, um, boy, I tell you, you know, when you look at the verses in context of that, it really opens up the last part of this chapter. And so I'll begin reading in verse number... Uh, 8 and come on. Well, let's begin reading verse 7. He says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman wait for, uh, waited for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he received it early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your heart, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering and of what? Patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You've heard of the patience of Job and, and have seen the end of the Lord. And the Lord is very pitiful and tender mercy. Speaking about how God blessed Job at the end of Job's, at, at the end of the trial that he gone, had gone through there. That's what that's referring to, I believe. And so at this point, we see um, uh, this influence of being patient in view of, okay? Be patient in view of. Now, verse 12 seems to just have a statement or two that seems to be totally at random, but it's not. Look at verse number 12. He says, But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, let your yea be yea, and your nay be nay, lest you fall into condemnation. Now this is a pe peculiar issue that Jews had. When they really wanted to make a point about something, they would swear by something greater. And it was more of a custom, more of an idiosyncrasy of Hebrew people at that time. Um, when somebody in our culture gets all fired up, they're liable to say or do anything. Uh, some people, uh, you know, they have certain idioms or certain things that they'll say or do or, you know, to emphasize a point. Well, I'll tell you one thing, you know, and they'll, they'll rant. Or they'll say... Uh, well, I'll, I'll swear my mama's grave, blah, 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 you know, or they'll do this. Well, this is what, this is the type of thing that is being talked about. They're swearing by heaven to this or that. Now, Jesus condemned that in the Sermon on the Mount. If you hold your place here, turn back to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And, um, and, and we'll see this. Um, if I can get there, Matthew chapter 5. In verse number um, 33, I believe it is. Um, he says in verse 33, uh, And again, ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is the footstool, his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. Let your communication be what? Yea, yea, nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than these cometh evil. So 
is getting down to how we communicate. When you are hurt, like I am tonight, when you are hurt, you say things. Depending on your personality, um, you might say it any kind of way. If, if you're one of those people that think out loud, like myself, uh, you're liable to say anything and then realize, you know, I probably shouldn't have said that, okay? If you are a person that doesn't say much at all and you think it through on the inside and then you say something, if you're hurt uh, and you do say something, uh, you liable to explode because you bottled it up on the inside and now a volcano comes forth, okay? But now, if you look at what James is saying here, and look at what Jesus said there in, in the Sermon on the Mount as well, if you look here, this is a wonderful reminder to these people during this time. Because if you're going through trials, and you've got your back up, as they say, or, you, or you're fired up about something, or you're hurt about something, what are you liable to do and say? You are liable to say uh, and do things that you know, first of all, you can't do. Or that is beyond your capability of doing. And so someone might be willing to swear by Jerusalem or by, by heaven or by this or by that. Why? Because they are spouting off or they're reacting in a verbal way. And so James is saying, you know what? You need to be patient. And when you spout off on all these for swearing of these different things, obviously you're running your mouth and you're not being patient during this trial. Make sense? So that's what's being said here, and it's a good reminder to all of us and how timely it is tonight. So he goes on and says, lest you fall into condemnation. Jesus mentioned a similar thing. You know, we need to be careful. Uh, we can be snared by our words, and so we must be careful. Now, look at verse 13. The thought progression is this. Whatever state you're in during these trials and during these troubles, just be patient. Be careful what you say. Let it be yes and let it be no. Don't go beyond any of that. Is any among you, verse 13, afflicted? Is there any afflicted? What does it say? Let him pray. If you're going to say something, pray. Amen? Amen. That's good stuff right there. If you're afflicted, let him pray. Is he married? Let him sing. Okay? So if, if, if you're hurting, pray about it. If you're happy, sing. Amen? Is there any sick among you? Let him mope and bellyache. No. What does it say? Let him call for the elders of the church. And what? Let them pray over him. Anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of the faith and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Now, I'm going to come back to that in a minute. But before we get into that, think about this. So we're, we're going through a trial, we're, 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 we're being afflicted, whatever that affliction might be, wherever that pressure is coming from. Is it coming from outside persecution? Is it coming from the inside with our old flesh just having a battle? Um, is, it a, is it a trial? Is it a temptation? Um, you know, what, what, what's the thing that has got you, uh, going, got you down? What kind of tribulation are we talking about? Now, James has hit everything in this letter. He's, he's categorically talked about these broad groups and sources of them and where they come from and how we should view them. Right? Amen. Okay, so he gets here to the end of the letter. He says, look, yes and no. Keep it simple. Be patient. Yes and no. If you are afflicted, pray. Don't complain, but what? Pray. If you're happy, sing. Amen? If you're sick, have somebody come pray for you. Amen. I love that. Isn't that good? And it's just a reminder because you know what? When you're going through troubles, nobody likes to be alone. Misery loves company, right? So what do we do? We have to communicate the fact that we're miserable. And so we're in search. I want somebody to be miserable with me. There's where another sin comes into play, taking up offenses. 
Ken has a problem with a neighbor. Ken comes and talks to him and he says, Preacher, I'm going to tell you what about so-and-so. Man, they're sorry and go to dirt. Man, you know what that rascal done to me? Can you believe that? Ken begins to express all his frustration for his neighbor. And next thing you know, old Andrew, the preacher, he's getting all fired up now. And before long, Ken's got me convinced that this guy is a devil incarnate over here as a neighbor. And the next thing I'm going to do as preacher, I'm going to help Ken out. So not only does Ken have a problem that he's hurt by his neighbor, but Ken's gossip, and Andrew has fell for that, and Andrew has taken up offenses of something that I have nothing to do with. Now, if Ken wanted to come talk to me and have me pray, I'd be glad to pray, right? And that'd be the thing to do. But the next thing I know, I've taken up an offense, and now I've inserted myself, whether I have actively done it with the neighbor or not. I have still now taken up offense. I've taken sides in a situation, and now what have I done? I'm upset. I'm saying things. I'm sinning. Right? So we have to be careful. we got to be careful that we don't take up offense. Now, this thing about calling for the elders of the church to pray over them, anointing them with oil, that, my friend, is not a public thing. I don't think for one moment that that's a public thing. Um, I had been asked to, somebody's come forward before and want me to put oil on them and pray over them and this and that. And in a service, and um, you know, I and they, they'll talk about James chapter five and all this stuff, and I I'm hesitant to do that because I don't see that as a public thing. That's a private thing. I, in that passage, I see somebody at home who's afflicted, who is hurting, who is on their sick bed, maybe. And, and, and they're calling for the elders of the church. It isn't necessarily the preacher. It could be some older Christian, some older brother. But they'll call them, and what are they going to do? They're going to pray for them. And there's a certain thing going to take place here. That gentleman or that lady is going to do what? He's going to, going to pray over the Lord should raise him up and commit his sins they should be forgiven him. And verse 16 clarifies there, confess your faults one to another or resolve your conflicts one to another and pray for one another. They should be healed. So the, the purpose in someone calling for help in prayer and anointing with oil and all this sort of thing, that is a done in a private thing. That is done in a, in a, in a private way. Those things are made public in that private conversation. In other words, there might be some things where the elders come in and there might be some sins talked about or some, maybe that's the reason why this person is afflicted is because God is chastening them and maybe they feel like it's best and, hey, this is what I've done. I ask God to forgive me. Uh, maybe it's a, something between them and some other person. Please forgive me. Whatever. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be right with God. God has shown this to me. Whatever. And they anoint him symbolically with the oil there. A uh, picture of the Holy Spirit. And what do you do? You pray and that person can be healed. The Bible says there, the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Amen? And their sins be forgiven and so on. What are you doing? Well, the next verse kind of overarchingly uh, explains in, 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 in a macro point of view what's going on. It says there in verse number 16, it says, confess your faults one to another. Literally, resolve your conflicts. Resolve your conflicts. You know, um, you show me a complainer, and I'll show you somebody who has unresolved conflicts. Somebody needs to do some, some fessing up, as they say. Amen? When you're constantly blaming someone else for your situation, you probably should look in the mirror. Now, granted, there are times when, yes, you are the, the, the object of criticism or you're the object of someone's hatred and animosity. Yes, I get that. I've been there and been the recipient of that, and I'm sure you have been there and been the recipient of that in different ways, right? We all understand what that can be like. 
Sometimes it's in the family. Sometimes it's in the neighborhood. Sometimes it's on the job, right? Sometimes it's even found in the church house. Isn't that sad? But the Bible says here, confess your faults one to another. Resolve these things. And pray for one another that you what? May be healed. I tell you what, there is a bomb in Gilead tonight. Amen. His name is Jesus. And the blood of Jesus can cover a multitude of sins. Amen. I don't know if y'all, how many of you ever hung sheetrock before? Wallboard. You, you don't talk about. Now, when I was first introduced into doing that, I thought things had to just be so. I mean, I'm thinking from the point of view of doing woodworking. If you're going to put panels together in wood or, or metal or something, man, you want to get that stuff pretty close. But in sheetrock, there's a lot of room for budging. You know what I'm saying? You can have a gap that wide, it ain't no big deal. Throw some mud in there, throw some tape, go on. Yeah. I mean, that's a fact. You can get away with some of that. Now, that's not the most professional way of doing it, but sheetrock mud is like the blood of Jesus. It covers a whole lot. Amen? You can take an old ratty piece of wallboard that has dings in it, right? Been scratched up just a little bit. Maybe it doesn't look like everything else, but man, I tell you what, you finally get that bugger nailed up in place and go along there and put a little mud here and put a little mud there, put a little tape in there. You know what? You heal that board and that board's up there and you know you put a little paint on that thing and you'll never know that that board, what it looked like before you done. And you know what? God can take us with all our rough edges and all our tears and all our little dents and dings and the blood of Jesus can heal a whole lot. If people would just be willing to come together and resolve conflict. It's, it's not that hard. But what keeps people from doing that? Pride. Pride. Simple pride. As long as you think you have to be right all the time and you have to be this, you know what? Your pride will never let you Fix anything. I know a preacher one time, and, he, and, he, and I understand what he was saying, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm natured just a little bit differently. You put me in the corner, I will come out swinging. I, I get that. I'm, and, and you're the same way. Ken don't say a word back there. Ken's nice. Ken's quiet. He's just he's my buddy. Amen. But I tell you what, you put Ken in the right situation, he's going to come out swinging. Everybody would. Right? Even somebody's mild-mannered as Ken. I know a preacher one time, I said, would you split a church over, over an issue? And I said, would you intentionally split a church? He says, if I was right and I knew I was right and it was scriptural, yes, I would split a church over an issue if I, if I believed God was in it and it was not the right thing. And, you know, and I know what he meant when he said that. I know he, I know he was trying, and I believe he's right on that, okay? But, you know, part of me says, wait a minute. Do we need to die on that mountain? Or can we just agree to disagree and move on? And he, this gentleman made it, made it a point, you know, depending on what the issue was, obviously. But we gotta, we got to realize that, you know, we are a mixed bag of nuts here in this church. And in your home, obviously, uh, depending on your home, I suppose you can say the same thing about your house. I don't know. But the fact is, uh, a lot of our tribulations in life and troubles in life come from areas and things that if we would just practice what the Bible teaches, those issues would resolve themselves. Amen? And we can move forward. And so he says, confess your faults one to another and what? Pray for one another. Why is that important? Well, I tell you what, if you pray for some, I mean, if you're genuinely praying for somebody, you won't stay mad at them very long. That's one reason why God made Job pray for his enemies. Pray for his friends. Pray for his enemies. When Job prayed for his friends, that's when God blessed him. Remember that? God has reminded me of that in recent months. You know, here's the thing. If somebody has wronged you, the best thing you can do is pray for them and not run your mouth about them. 
There are times when you have to say things depending on the situation because of what's happened. Yes, you have to say things, whether it be publicly or privately. Hey, that has to happen at times. I get that. But to constantly just go over and over and over and over and over again, spread gossip and maligning people and this and that, you can, you can spread cover and, and justify why you do what you do. I get that. But at the end of the day, if you're truly praying for somebody, you will not stay mad at them very long. More often than not, you'll end up being feeling sorry for them. And you'll end up having such a burden for them. And you know what? That tribulation you're going through will be gone. Now, I know that by experience. I'm sure some of y'all can expound and give your own stories. But I'll share one from my pastor, my Brother Bobby. Years ago, um, there was a split at, at Gospel Light years ago, and a bunch of people left and went and started another church, and blah, 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 blah. You know, you go on and tell all the stories. Well, there was a, if I remember this right, there was an individual in that that had really done Pastor wrong. Went off and to another church and had spread a bunch of gossip and had spread, said a bunch of different things and, and this and that. And, um, uh, you know, hurt Brother Bobby really bad. Well, years and years and years gone by. And I used to could tell you how, how many years it was, but Brother Bobby knew what it was. But one, one night after church, I don't remember if it was a Sunday night or a Wednesday night, at that time, the parsonage at Gospel Light was, you know, where the parking lot is now, like right, right beside the church, but in front of the school, and it was sitting over here. And Brother Bobby had just got in in the house after everybody was closing the church and everybody's going home. He had walked over. And I mean, Miss Jackie, I think, had already got into bed. You know, she was already tucked in and he was getting ready. And here come the doorbell ring. So Brother Bobby goes to the door and like so many times. And, and it was so-and-so. And I uh, said, Brother Bobby, the guy was crying. He said, Brother Bobby, I just got to talk to you. Do you have a minute? Well, sure, come on in. He sat there at the coffee table. And he said, Preacher, he says, I've done you wrong. I, you know, you remember who I am? Yeah, I know you are. He said, Man, I've done you wrong. Man, I, I said this and this and this years ago, and I've done all this. And, and uh, he said, I just, I, I just want you to, uh, I want you to forgive me. And Brother Bobby says, Well, the truth is, sir, he says, I forgave you a long time ago. He says, but I, but I appreciate you coming to talk to me. And, and they prayed there and rejoiced in the Lord together. This guy got right with God. But Brother Bobby prefaced everything I just said by saying this. He said, the hurt from that guy was so immense. He said, it would swell up in Brother Bobby at times. I mean, it just, he said, like a mountain on the inside of him. And finally, he just gave that thing to God and began to pray for this guy. And finally, God gave Brother Bobby peace. Now, Get this, it was years and years later before reconciliation was fully made. But guess who enjoyed those years more than the other? The one who prayed. You understand what I'm trying to say tonight? So, you know, whoever's right and wrong really isn't always an issue so much as it is moving forward and, and being right with God. Amen? Now, we're going to stop here because I want to spend some time on this about Elijah for next Wednesday night. Lord willing. And we'll finish up uh, James chapter 5, excuse me, next week. The Lord willing. Now, let's kind of uh, circle the wagons here just a little bit. In the book of James, we have seen a very frank conversation about how to live our Christian life. Amen? Some do's and some don'ts. We've been reminded about our character, been reminded about where some of our problems lie. And, and, and we need to have a relationship with the Word of God. We need to look into that perfect law of liberty and continue therein. We ought not be a forgetful here. We need to realize we need wisdom. We need to pray for that. Amen? And uh, we got to be careful about what we say. 
The tongue is a fire. You know what I'm saying? And, and all these things that we, we've talked about. And so he comes on down and he kind of brings it all together, reminding us that, you know what, we just need to be patient during these tribulations and times. And the secret to peace and joy in the midst of adversity is not by making somebody else look bad to make yourself look good. I tell you what, the, the secret to that is still prayer and practicing what the scriptures teach. Amen? Job's a great example of that. Job was not perfect. He made mistakes. But you know what? Job endured. I have not met anybody on planet Earth in these 43, almost 44 years that I've been living, I have yet to see anybody who even remotely comes close to Job as far as trials are concerned. I have not met anybody. And if Job can come out on top, I do believe you and I can do the same. Amen? And we just need to keep our eyes on the Lord. Amen? There's so much, so much in this passage here that we can uh, talk about. But I, I just, we just need to remember here, as far as these verses tonight, that it's best when there's an issue between you and a brother or sister, you need to deal with that. Amen? Deal with it. And don't put wood on the fire. Proverbs talks about taking the wood off the fire. Amen? And he that hath knowledge spareth his words. You know? And, if, and, you know, and another thing I've been learning this year in my life as a believer and I've seen it over and over in the scripture, and the Lord showed it to me, but I hadn't, I hadn't really practiced it. But you know what? Um, if you're right, you don't have to defend yourself. If you're standing on scripture, you listen, you ain't got to, you don't have to say nothing. My mama used to say, the more you stir it, the stinkier it's gonna get. Amen. You don't have to, you don't have to say anything. You know, just leave her be. And I found that, you know, a lot of times it's best just to keep your big mouth shut. Amen. That's hard for somebody like me. You know. Now before you start laughing at me, Shirley, I, I, you know, I know you just a little bit. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Well, I tell you what, I appreciate y'all coming tonight. We'll finish up this uh, chapter next week. And then I believe, Lord willing, once we get through that, I believe we're going to start on Wednesday night. It's going to take us a while. But we're going to start the book of Genesis, and we're going to work our way through that. And it's going to be wonderful. We're going to have a great time. You know, it's the foundations of our whole society, the foundations of our life, our marriages, our families. All of the principles are found in the book of Genesis. Amen? And so it's a book of beginnings. So we're going to look at that and delve in there. And what we probably will end up doing especially because of the type of um, study this is going to be. Uh, I will probably be giving some handouts, and I'm, and I'm probably going to open up where we can have some question answer in there as well on some of these things because I know there that people have some questions, and so we might even have a box or something where you could submit a question or something. I could try to make sure that we either try to answer that through the lesson or maybe bring it up for a discussion or something. But I don't want to get in a hurry. I've never gone verse by verse through Genesis. I think it would be wonderful to do that, okay? So we're going to have a good time with that. And Miss Jenna's going to help us out with some of the stuff in the church bulletin um, going forward with some of the stuff about Genesis and creation and things. So it's going to be a lot of fun, okay? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father